The Suzuki brand is based on five brand values that describe its character and vision. Such an intangible value is an idea, but it is not a form. It is the task of a corporate design to shape the invisible character of a brand into a visible thing. The corporate design is a tool to create brand moments. Moments that follow the same vision but interpret it differently according to the particular task in different kinds of cultures or markets. As knights in medieval tournaments showed off their symbols of heritage to their challengers, today's brands differ from one another. The marketer of modern times defines every single detail of his brand. Big guidebooks make sure that every piece of stationery, every price tag or every other little detail looks like it is supposed to, and as a result, many brands become rather boring. Suzuki has tried to walk another path to brand consistency and unique perception. Instead of defining every detail, only some visual ingredients have been laid down. This strategy of rules, instead of rights and wrongs, follows a simple idea. This idea is called the Snow Crystal Principle. Snow crystals make a long journey from the sky down to the earth. During this journey, the crystals continuously change their shape and structure. However, each snow crystal follows one simple rule, the 60 degree angle. This rule tells it to grow its six arms in six precisely defined directions. All crystals look similar, but none look exactly the same. While a snow crystal has one rule to follow, the Suzuki corporate design will give five rules to create and shape the Suzuki way of life. This film will take you on a journey to the key design ingredients of colour, logo, structure, typeface and, finally, photography. This house can be found somewhere near the Swedish capital of Stockholm. Its wooden structure reflects a dark and rusty red tone in the afternoon sunlight. In fact, most houses here look like that. Forlun red, as the colour is called, is the result of a string of many events in history. At its beginning, stands King Johann III, who painted the roof of his palace red, and, to cut a long story short, over the coming centuries, more and more houses, churches and public buildings were painted in that fallen red colour. 
Forlun's copper mine is thought to be at least 1,000 years old and is of great significance to Swedish history and the country's wealth. Forlun Red was produced as a byproduct of the mining activities in the great copper mountain of Forlun. You see this? This is mud that is uh, naturally produced down in the mine. Because when the rainwater is passing through the cracks of the mountain and comes down here, it takes some material from the mountain with it. Okay. So if you take this mud and you burn it inside an oven in 800 degrees, it becomes a red powder, a pigment. Then you take this red pigment and you mix it with wheat flour and water and you get fall red paint. Okay. In the early times, the paint pigments were mixed with wood tar. Later, it was found that the paint had preserving qualities and prolonged the lives of the vulnerable wooden buildings. The red-coloured houses became the symbol of the Swedish landscape. The Forlun example shows how well colour works as a means for identification and differentiation. In the year 2003, the Italian priest Alex Zanatelli came up with this rainbow flag as a symbol for peace. It became the optimistic new logo for a global peace movement. The flag was part of a campaign called Peace to All Balconies. The idea was taken up well, copied and was exported to more and more countries people around the world started to produce their own flags and within a few months an estimated three million were to be seen everywhere. This Parcha flag is a precise example for what a logo can be at most. It is a fast, direct and easy to remember symbol that allows you to express your sense of belonging. It does not need to explain or inspire. It is just a hook on which one can hang all information and emotion about something. simple microorganism to a complex human being, from a bookshelf to a metropolis, there is always a construction plan to hold together all the elements. To understand the power of structures, the city of cities, Manhattan, serves as an intriguing example.
Because of the famous Commissioner's Plan of 1811, Manhattan Island was divided into a visionary regular street grid. Driven by economic and logic considerations, a grid of 16 numbered and lettered avenues and 155 orthogonal cross streets was developed, regardless of the topology of the area. Avenues were to be exactly 922 feet, the cross streets 200 feet apart. This structure resulted in approximately 2,000 long and narrow blocks. At the time, the idea got criticized for its utter monotony. Though seemingly repetitive from a bird's view, a horizontal perspective offers a different world on each street corner. Manhattan became one of the most exciting cities, ever changing from corner to corner. People, cultures, activities, styles, light, and even the scent are very different from one part of the city to another. Johannes Gutenberg is said to be born around the year 1400 in the German city of Mainz. The man is credited for the invention of movable type printing in Europe and mechanical printing globally. Gutenberg's genius new way of combining technologies and developing an advanced printing process led the Time Life magazine to call his work the most important invention of the second millennium. His printing technology eventually fueled the European Renaissance and most certainly marks the beginning of our mass medialized civilization. So. Holdet. Herzlichen Dank. <laughs> now, observed from a design perspective, Gutenberg's printing press offered yet another important innovation. Before movable type printing was introduced, pages were either cut by hand into wooden blocks or, even earlier, was simply copied in handwriting tediously in European monasteries. Before Gutenberg, the design of letters was defined by individuals. Since Gutenberg, though, movable letters were reused, and recognizable typefaces were the result. During the last 550 years, all kinds of innovations and technologies have changed the world of typography and have led to a huge variety of individual typefaces used for and in any kind of media.
The term photography originates from the Greek words phos and graphis and would translate as drawing with the light. Long before the first photograph was captured on paper in the early 19th century, man was obsessed with depicting his world. At least 30,000 years ago, people started to draw pictures of what was of importance or of danger to them. Since prehistoric times, the world of pictures has made a long journey from dark caves to the bright high streets of our times. The visual culture of Japan is known for its plentifulness, diversity and ubiquity. In a country where written language uses thousands of individual characters, pictures are historically important to all forms of communication. In Japan, pictures are everywhere. The old Japanese woodblock prints are called yukyo-e, meaning pictures of the floating world. Their equivalent today can be experienced in a manga shop like this one in the Shibuya district of Tokyo. Two floors below the ground, tens of thousands of books with hundreds of pictures each wait for a reader to buy them. It is said that weekly sales of mangas in Japan exceed the yearly output of the US American comic magazine industry. Pictures are a perfect means to tell a story in an instant and with emotions. Corporate design is like a game of football with simple but strict rules. No one game is like any other. There will always be new and surprising combinations. And just like that, the five elements, color, logotype, structure, typeface, and photography are the tools to make the Suzuki way of life become visible. <laughs> 